Ceratopsians are my favorite group of dinosaurs. They aren't any different in their differences than groups like the Hadrosaurs or Pachycephalosaurs, in that they have remarkably similar bodies but extremely different noggins. However, they were better because they had huge heads and shearing beaks and piercing horns. Fight me. Yeah, I don't care that there were really only like two that you could call huge. They all have their own special things going on, meanie. The Late Cretaceous Epoch, the last chunk of the eponymous Cretaceous period, saw a great many changes across North America. First of all, the whole continent was cleaved in two by the high seas. There were no global ice sheets to speak of, so all that water had to go somewhere. Thanks to the way the North American continent was shaped, that water overcame the lowest elevated places through the center, creating the shallow inland sea called the Western Interior Seaway. It split North America into as many as three continents for many tens of millions of years. To the east were two continents that have a really bad modern fossil record and therefore don't get as much attention, Appalachia and Franklinia, or Northern Appalachia. To the west was Laramidia. Thanks to a quirk in the geology, erosion, and flora of the continent, the Laramidian fossil record seems to be largely the best preserved and most easily accessible. Over the last 30 years, paleontologists have been pulling all sorts of weird horned dinosaurs out of rock layers that were once the ground surface of this extinct subcontinent. And each one continues to prove that at least the horned dinosaurs were capable of huge, diverse feats of quick evolutionary changes. There are dinosaur hotspots throughout what was once the coastline of Laramidia, Grand Staircase Escalante, much of Montana, northwestern New Mexico, Coahuila, Mexico, and Alberta. According to paleontologist Mark Lowen, less than 1% of the diversity of horned dinosaurs is currently known. This cannot be clearer than in the fact that these horned dinosaur communities are only coming out of specific areas that are good for fossil collecting. With as many as are being found in these spots, imagine the true diversity that was present across the entire continent, in the mountains, plains, beaches, and more across the middle and west coast of Laramidia. California must hold an untold cornucopia of horned forms that may never be recovered. That being said, we must now draw attention to one of the more northern spots of horned dinosaur biodiversity, Montana, for it has released another of its horned dinosaurs for us to add into our pantheon of paleontological data. All the way back in the spring of 2019, for many of us the worst year in recent memory, private fossil collector Mark Eatman stumbled upon some dinosaur fossils eroding out of an outcrop that belongs to the late Cretaceous-aged McClelland Ferry member of the Judith River Formation. Eatman found this outcrop on private land of the Wallery Ranch in Kennedy Cooley, north of the town of Rudyard and south of the Milk River in Hill County, northern Montana. Eatman, along with Clayton Phipps, was responsible for the discovery and collection of the dueling dinosaurs specimen. Eatman got a bunch of other paleontologists and fossil preparators out there, and they opened up a quarry to get what turned out to be a horned dinosaur specimen out of the rock and into a prep lab. That prep lab happened to be Fossil Logic LLC in Pleasant Grove, Utah. Their team opened up the field jackets and prepared the rock matrix away from the fossils to the best of their ability. The specimen consists of a nearly complete skull, a back vertebra, the shoulder girdle, the pelvis, and the vertebrae it attaches to, plus a few tail bones. Once everything was prepared, they also reconstructed, mounted, and cast the fossils, creating a fully mounted reconstructed skull of the animal. Fossil Logic did what is common to many fossil preparation and reconstruction companies. They scan all the fossils and or mold and cast all of the fossils and then mess around with resin copies of the originals. That is how they came up with an undistorted 3D cast replica of the skull. The workers will also cut up copies of the skulls of close relatives to fill in any completely missing parts. In the case of this horned dinosaur, the missing pieces were many of the connecting bits in between the major chunks, like the end of the snout, the jaws, the horns, cheeks, and much of the frill. 
This specimen was found on private land by private fossil collectors, so it was sold. However, it was thankfully acquired by a museum, the Museum of Evolution in Denmark. This allowed for the public display of the fossils as well as perpetual access to researchers, leading to its formal description, which has just been recently published in the journal PeerJ by a huge team of scientists led by Mark Lowen, including such familiar faces as Joe Surtick, Scott Sampson, Jingmei O'Connor, Savannah Carpenter, Andrew Fark, Peter Makovicki, Nick Longrich, and David Evans plus the addition of Brock Sisson of Fossilogic and Anna Olenschlea of the Denmark Museum. When this horned dinosaur was first being excavated, the team thought it may belong to the genus Medusaceratops or Albertaceratops. It wasn't until they were piecing all of the skull fragments together and starting to reconstruct it that they realized what they had on their hands was a completely new genus of horned dinosaur. It was officially named Lokiceratops rangiformis, with the genus name being Loki's Horned Face, and the species name in reference to the shape of the antlers in caribou, which genus name is Rangifer. Lokiceratops here is most unusual for its apparent asymmetrical frill horns, hence the caribou comparison. Specifically, Lokiceratops had a small upwards projecting hornlet on the right side of the middle of the frill and a giant horn on the left side. Right after these horns were the biggest paddle-shaped sideways projecting horns that gave it the Loki moniker. These laterally projecting ram's horns are very similar to what is seen in Medusaceratops. Comparisons have also been made to Albertaceratops, however, its horns differ more obviously. Lokiceratops is distinct from these two other ceratopsians due to the number of horns it has as well at least 10 on each side of the head from the bottom of the squamosal bone, the lower part of the frill, all the way to the top and middle of the parietal bone, the upper part of the frill. Albertoceratops has 9 and Medusaceratops has 8. Lokiceratops is missing a nose horn, something the other two have, uh, though their nose horns are more like bumps, ridges, or bosses rather than the traditional nose horns of other horned dinosaurs. Compared to the size of the pelvis and shoulder girdle, it seems, at least based on many pieces of art provided with the paper, that Lokiceratops had a disproportionately large head with a long, low snout. Now that we have a general idea of what this critter looked like, what about its size? In order to get a good idea of how large Lokiceratops was visually, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme. Based on the scale bar included in the paper with the skull illustrations, plus what is documented in the text itself, the skull measures around 2 meters in length. According to one of the illustrations of the whole animal provided with the study, Lokiceratops may have stood as much as 2.5 meters 8.2 feet in height up to the top of its frill, or about just 2 meters at the back. It may have reached as much as 6.7 meters or 22 feet in length, and weighed in as much as 5 tons. This makes the animal the largest of its family ever found. Speaking of which, what the hell kind of horn head was Lokiceratops? Let's have a look. Thanks, Mr. Man. The paper authors used the phylogenetic software TNT and Mesquite to get an idea of where Lokiceratops placed in the Ceratopsian family tree. When all of its unique anatomical traits were turned into numerical data and thrown in with all of the anatomical trait data of a bunch of other ceratopsians, Lokiceratops was found to place most closely to Albertoceratops and Medusaceratops as part of the Centrosaurinae family. Not a big surprise there. However, this analysis found that there was enough evidence to separate out these three dinosaurs into their own group. And thus, they described the Albertosaurini tribe, with Lokiceratops as the most primitive member and Albertoceratops and Medusaceratops being sister taxa that diverged from Lokiceratops later. This new group is now the earliest diverging group of the Centrosaurs, right before the Eucentrosaur group that contains the majority of the known Centrosaur tree. It seems to have split from the tree after the divergence of the Nasutoceratopsini tribe of blunt-nosed cow-horned animals. Interestingly, the Lokiceratops paper found the grouping of Yawekauceratops and Menificeratops to place outside of the Nasutoceratopsini as earlier diverging centrosaurs, right next to Diabloceratops and Machairoceratops. I think it's interesting to note that the authors used data from the rather dubious Avaceratops here, but also didn't use data from the recently described Fricatoceratops. 
This last bit may just be a consequence of how long it takes to complete a scientific paper. Perhaps any newer centrosaurs will take Lokiceratops and Furcatoceratops into account and leave out the rather poorly defined Avaceratops. Speaking of Lokiceratops being the largest of the newly christened Albertosaurini, when did it live and what did Montana look like at that time? Since Lokiceratops comes from the McClelland Ferry member of the Judith River Formation, it can be confidently dated to around 78.4 and 77.2 million years ago, thanks to radiometric and biochronologic dating methods. This was the Judithian land vertebrate age of the late Cretaceous Epoch. It was a time well after the early small to medium sized ceratopsians had evolved. The critters like Zuniceratops, Diabloceratops, and Machiraceratops. However, it was also well before the Western Interior Seaway began receding directly prior to the K pig mass extinction or the evolution of the later Triceratopsine chasmosaurs, such as Triceratops and Taurosaurus. As with most dig sites located along what was once coastline, Lokiceratops seems to have been buried in a swamp. This is proven by the sediments surrounding the fossils being carbonaceous fine-grained sandstones, siltstones, and mudstones. The whole region was likely a poorly drained fluvial system. In other words, a sopping wet mess of a freshwater to brackish water estuary or swamp. It likely was not quite a floodplain since those usually do drain out. The Lokiceratops quarry site also coughed up the scales of garfish, the shells of mollusks, carbonized plant remains, petrified wood, and chunks of amber. This all points to a warm, moist biome similar to what is seen in Utah and New Mexico at the same time, all of which is actually a lot more like the Everglades in Florida or bayous in Louisiana. Before I discuss what other types of animals lived with Lokiceratops, I want to touch on why Lokiceratops is important to the study of horned dinosaurs. Lokiceratops was not alone. It lived in the exact same time and place as Wendyceratops, Medusaceratops, and Albertaceratops. This is therefore the most horned dinosaur rich area ever found. Historically, paleontologists were under the assumption that ecosystems could only hold about two types of horned dinosaur at any one time, a chasmosaur and a centrosaur. This is now proven false without a shadow of a doubt. This also proves that these dinosaurs were more than capable of avoiding competition with one another despite any similarities they may share. They were likely chowing down on very, very slightly different things, but considering their beaks and jaws are some of the most similar anatomical traits, this is a very minor thing. Instead, they were under extreme levels of sexual selective pressures, like birds of paradise or deer. I made the seemingly logical connection between the horned dinosaurs and the extreme variation in species of Darwin's finches, but this is not a good analog since the differences in the finches is niche partitioning. They have different types of beaks for eating different foods. These centrosaurs had pretty much the same mouths, but their decorative frills and horns were completely or nearly completely different in even as small an area as a handful of kilometers. This is why lead author Mark Lowen says that he and his colleagues think that less than 1% of the true diversity of these dinosaurs is known. Any one ecosystem could hold at least four centrosaurs, and yet to be described, ceratopsians will continue to up those numbers. But enough of the hornheads. Who else did Loki ceratops have to contend with? I already mentioned gar, and they were joined by giant sturgeons and paddlefish. The bubble-headed moose face, Brachylophosaurus, was the far more common herbivorous dinosaur, possibly traveling in large groups to mash up all sorts of veggies. The four centrosaurs were not the only horned dinosaurs either, as the square-frilled, curly-horned Judiceratops joined them as the one-odd chasmosaur. Probrachylophosaurus may have been present as well, though not from the exact same part of the McClelland ferry member. The Tyrannosaurus despletosaurus and Gorgosaurus have been recovered from sections of the Judith River formation, but none that are super duper close to Lokiceratops. That being said, tyrannosaurs were definitely present even if they were not the exact same genera. Dromaeosaurs, ornithomimosaurs, marine birds, pachycephalosaurs, pterosaurs, crocs, frogs, notosaurs, and ankylosaurs were also present. A bustling world that seemed less connected to all the other ecosystems down the coast of Laramidia. That's it for now. Lokiceratops definitely presents an interesting face. 
Some researchers have issued caution on this one being a completely new genus, arguing that its differences from its closest relatives in time, space, and evolution originate in individual variation. The Lokiceratops paper author team definitely provide robust justification for Lokiceratops being too distinct to be lumped into known genera, but the possibility remains open. Only more fossils, like usual, will prove that one way or the other. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.